Hi everyone, my name's Chris Jarlin. And I'm Grant Robson. Together, we're Wickham 89. We're a media company and we do a lot of film work and photography work. If you know the Customs House, you might have seen us behind the scenes, uh, filming a variety of different shows from Joe McEldry to the pantomime to special adverts to the 25th year celebrations last year and a whole host of other different projects where you'll have probably seen us behind the camera. We're doing something a little bit different today in front of it. Um, we've been filmmakers for several years and are both really passionate about film in media. Grant, what's your favourite uh, film? Favourite film? Back to the Future Part 2. Part 2, good choice. Um, mine might be Jaws, maybe Star Wars. Um, I'm sure you've got some favourite films as well. But we actually make films. This is a documentary we made actually last year for a, um, a charity fundraiser called Colin Bergen Toys, better known as The Big Pink Dress. We've also made zombie horror films as well as a load of different adverts um, and different projects for places like the Customs House. Today, we're going to show you how to get involved if you have ever wanted to make your own film. One of the planning stages to do for that and something that we call storyboarding. Storyboarding is the planning stage where you kind of have maybe already written your script, you know what the actors are going to say, but you want to think, what is the film actually going to look like? Um, and that's what we're going to do a little bit today. First, Grant's going to show you um, a little bit of a template that he's drawn but where we're going to start visualising our film before we start making it. Okay, so every film you've ever watched is most likely being storyboarded. That's through animations or feature films with live action characters. All of the Marvel films are storyboarded as well. And this really helps a filmmaker to visualise before they have to get all the camera equipment and lights out, how a film's actually going to look. Okay, so what I've made here is um, a little storyboard for us. Um, all it is is a couple of boxes. So you just get a sheet of paper and a pen and draw yourself out eight, 12 boxes on every page. And then as you gradually progress, you'll end up having a visual story. Um, it also works for things like comic books or um, illustrated novels, things like that. Um, so this process is used not just in film, but in a lot of other fields as well. And it helps you get a bit more creative as well while you're planning films. Yeah, if you want to make a film, make a comic book, do a stop motion, this is something that you can use. Now, is it just any sort of squares you've drawn, Grant? Um, I've drawn a specific type of square. So what you'll notice is when you watch a film or you watch the television with your parents, it's not exactly a box, okay? It's not an exact perfect square. It's called an aspect ratio and it's a bit of an oblong shape, okay? You don't need to know the specifics of it, but basically if you just draw two short sides on this side, and then two longer sides on that till you get like a bit of a brick shape. It's almost like visualising what your TV probably looks like at home. And again, this is something that we do before any films. Last year we made a zombie horror film and for all those different scenes, we planned what it was going to look like before. So when we were on set on the day and we didn't just have to think about what to tell the actors or how to set up the lighting equipment um, on the day, we, you know, we had that bit of a rough plan, which is great practice and makes a film look exactly how you wanted to. Uh, so if you want to be a filmmaker, this is something you need to learn. But you always start first with the script. You always need your story first, and then you move on to this. Okay? So let's imagine we've got our plan for a good story, and we want to include a load of different shots. And that's what we're going to look at today, a whole variety of different ones. Um, but it's going to give you the building blocks to be able to plan your own film. Now, the first one, you might have heard of some of these things like close-ups, um, in wide shots and we're going to start even further back than that. We're going to start with something called an extreme wide shot. And while I'm talking, uh, Grant's going to start drawing these as well. So what is an extreme wide shot? Well, that word extreme might give you a bit of a hint. First, we need to establish where our film's going to take place. Is it set in a castle? Is it set in a big city or town? Um, or is it set in the woods, someone's house, at the beach? This is important information that you want your audience to know, so they know where to expect their film to take place. So this is why we draw an extreme wide shot, so we can film an extreme wide shot afterwards. We want to establish where the location is going to be. So this one, you want to use the whole space, the whole um, 
screen sort of thing that you're planning on there to show a possible location. Grant, what are you drawing? So the first one I've drew in the extreme wide shot is an example of um, a centrally framed one. So at the middle, this is our wonderful castle, a little bit like the Disney castle. Just add a little bit more in there. Um, and this is just to establish where it's taking place. So if you think about films like the Chronicles of Narnia, something like that, they would always establish where this actual next scene is going to happen. So I've just drew a little bit of a few mountains there and I've drew a nice little castle. Now I've also done a cityscape. Now these would normally be at night. So obviously you just have lights in the windows and everything else would be dark. Okay, so. This is really important information to give for. So again, you are really helping your audience out. If they see something like a castle, maybe they know they're gonna get a fairy tale. If they see something like a dark cityscape like that, again, maybe it's going to be a gangster story or a superhero origin about, um, you know, how the villain became, um, came up with his evil plan or something like that. So again, this is really important information um, to start off giving your audience. How are they coming along, Grant? Are you happy with those two? Yeah, there they are. Well okay, done. so again, if you're drawing along, you might want to first draw, um, and again, you can use these in different orders and for different scenes, you might adjust the orders that you put them, but we're starting furthest back and we've so far on our sheet got an extreme wide shot, a location shot, sometimes called an establishing shot because it establishes for your audience where stuff is going to happen. So next we've gone from that extreme wide and we're still gonna be pretty wide, but this time it's just what we call a wide shot. Now, we've established the location that our film's going to take place. It might be a city or a town or a castle like Grandstrom, but then we want to start establishing the characters. Now, how do you do that? Well, we want to show them a full body shot and that's what we get with a wide shot or sometimes called a long shot, where we can see the person from head to toe. Grant, who are you drawing? So from the top of the wide shot where we've done the castle, I'm going into one of the bedrooms of the castle overlooking the town. Um, and again, these don't have to be anything amazing. You don't have to be fantastic at all. Um, I've just drew a little bit of a room. So we've got a little bit of floor in there. We've got a lovely little balcony looking out onto those mountains that we drew above. And we've just drew a little stick figure to show where we're gonna place our character in that shot. And then this introduces the audience to the character itself and a little bit of where they're from, what they do, or something about them in particular. Yeah, it's a useful piece of information. So we can not just first find out and physically see that character, but we get an idea of maybe um, their costume. So again, if they were wearing, you know, very smart clothes or if they were wearing the pajamas or a suit of armor, you know, this is a shot that would show off all those different things. You would see them in that location as well. Again, if, if someone was in their pajamas in a bedroom, well, maybe that character's about to go to bed. Um, again, if it was someone wearing a suit of armor in a big uh, grand ballroom, well, maybe that's a knight about to go on his mission. Again, this is really important information for other reasons too. Because it can show you about the characters themselves. Maybe their body language tells you something about the character. If it's a really athletic um, runner, they might, you know, you can see that in their body language and you can see how they move in that shot. You know, from seeing from head to toe, we find out that extra information. Maybe that's different from a character who might be an old creepy witch such as in Snow White. They might be hunched over trying to pretend um, to deceive the character by their, by their old sort of persona. So again, you know, what you can learn from this isn't just an interesting place to put the camera so you can see someone from head to toe, but it's actually given a lot of different bits of information too. Have you drawn another one there as well, Grant? Yeah, so in line with the other one we've drew, so we've drew a dark cityscape here, and then here we've got our mysterious character in the shadows. So again, I've just drew a stick figure. I've framed him a little bit to the left this time as opposed to the center on this one. And he's standing in front of a car and it's still nighttime here. So you can see how we're moving closer and closer into that story or into that uh, world that we're trying to create there. So interesting, so we've had a wide shot where we see a whole person. Well, we're gonna go a little bit closer now in something that we call a medium shot. A medium shot, uh, again, as you might guess, well, medium, like middle, that's kind of when you see from half a person. Usually from the waist, sort of from um, the top of the legs up to their head. So we can see their full body, heads and shoulders, but not knees and toes, knees and toes. Uh, so it's head, shoulders, but not knees and toes, knees and toes. 
Are you joining in with that at all? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, this is useful because seeing a character full body is pretty good, but we maybe can't see some of the detail on them. And again, if someone was wearing something like a suit of armor or their pajamas, well, maybe we'd like to see some of the detail on their clothes. Maybe we'd like to see their facial expressions um, or makeup or something like that in a better way. So this is a really interesting shot to use for that. A medium shot from the waist upwards. Who are you drawing, Grant? Um, so I've drew a king. So we've went from the castle and then we've went into this bedroom or this room and then we've got a king standing on the balcony. I've given him a little crown there and he's got a nice happy face because he's overlooking his kingdom. Um, again, as Chris says is, we're just framing the top half of his body, but it can be used for the bottom half as well. So a medium shot can just be half of the person that you're filming. It could be the top half or the bottom half. Again, it's a great way to see more focus. So again, if we were making a documentary about a runner, well, maybe we'd want to see a medium shot of some legs running past. Again, if they were really muscly, really challenging themselves, pushing themselves in a race, Again, this could be a great shot to show that. Or again, if someone was sitting at a desk, working on their homework, um, again, a medium shot might be a really good shot to use for that. Again, you can see that the top of their body is perhaps working, you know, the face concentrating on the work, their hands quickly writing the homework from the night before. But if they're just sitting at the kitchen table, their legs probably aren't really being used in that shot. So again, it's not very good practice to kind of um, have that space wasted. So we have a medium shot so we can see more detail closer up um, and get a better idea of what's going on from their expression and from their body language. So who's in that second medium shot, Graham? Um, so what I've done here is we've got this suspicious gangster man. So I've used the bottom half of his legs and he's walking forward. So what I've done just outside the box I've drawn is I've drew a little arrow. And this explains that either the character's walking forward or the camera's moving back, okay? So that's just a little tip for you there. If you are drawn and you're thinking about how you're gonna use your camera, you normally draw little arrows to see where people are looking, which way the camera would move, or which way the characters are gonna move in that scene, okay? Yeah, so sometimes when you're planning these shots, you might not just want to have them on a tripod, like we've got today where the camera's um, staying in one set position. You might want the camera to move as well, or indeed the character to move in it. So this is a great way to add some extra detail in there. You can add other details in as well as you're planning this, or if you want to make it something similar, like a comic book, you might want to add colour or voice um, text bubbles and stuff like that too. And again, that's a similar technique you can learn from this masterclass. So again, we've gone to a medium shot where you can see from the waist to the head. Now I mentioned a close-up before and we're not quite there yet, but we've got something called a medium close-up, which is kind of somewhere in between. A medium close-up is kind of usually from the chest upwards. Um, so again, this is even better in a thing if you, the next film or TV program you watch, I bet you see a lot of medium close-ups. Again, this is a very common shot because we see the character uh, and we get a really good look, still at their outfit, still at um, maybe some of the background behind them, but we can really now start to focus on their face, expressions, and what they're saying. So again, usually when a character is speaking, um, you'll see something like a medium close-up. Again, we get to see the expressions, the detail, and really focus on an as an audience on what they're saying. Not getting distracted by maybe different things in the backgrounds, different, um, you know, things going on in the scene. We're starting to really focus on one particular thing. And it's often with a medium close-up, what the character is saying or how they're reacting. Who are you drawing, Grant? So we're just continuing this little story we've made. I've got two stories going along here. Um, we've seen the castle, we've went to a wide shot of the room, we've had the king on the balcony, and now I've zoomed in on the king. You'll notice I've added a bit more detail here. So he's standing with his queen, give her a little crown there. It's going to go off shot, but that's fine. And he's overlooking his kingdom with a big smile on his face. So we can see how he's framed from the chest up, and we've cut off a little bit of the top of his head. So we've just got that, we've focused really well on his head, on his, on his features, on what he's looking at. I'm just going to continue with my creepy gangster guy as well. Okay, so yeah, so again, you know, it doesn't just have to be one character in a scene at the same time. So sometimes there will be multiple characters within a scene. Uh, and again, this is where in a video you would edit all those different parts together. So maybe if two people were having a conversation, you'd go from one medium close-up, maybe of someone like the king, 
uh, when he was talking, it would the shot would be on him, and then the camera would cut to the Queen, giving him an answer, perhaps. Um, and again, it would go to another medium close-up on her. Again, another great shot for the same reasons, using that to see some detail on her, to see her facial expressions, to hear the answer that she's given, and really focus on that. And then when the King replies, um, it cuts back to the medium close-up of him again. This is something really common, we call a shot reverse shot. And something in the next TV programme or film you're watching, I bet you see loads of examples of. Again, not just real people, but again, stop motion animation uses this too. Regular animation, CGI animation, as well as in stuff like comic books. So again, a really common technique you'll see for dialogue. How is that gangster coming on, Grant? Yeah, looking good now. So again, I've framed this man, not centrally on like we've done with the king here. We've went on for a side shot and we can see a character moving towards him in the shadows. So we can see he's waiting for somebody standing here. And this again is a medium close-up, but we've kept the top of his head in this time. So we've got a bit of his shoulders, we can see his facial expressions, and we can see somebody walking. So this is a bit of a, a perspective shot as well. So we can see someone in the background. Yeah, so again, if you feel more confident um, as an artist, you can add more and more detail into that background and start thinking, you know, what else could be there? Things being in focus or out of focus. Um, but don't worry if you're not a great artist, you know, it, in some of the storyboards I draw, just for kind of quickness sometimes and just to get a bit of a rough plan, you know, sometimes just a stick man um, can be enough just to give you a rough idea. So don't be put off if you don't think you're a great artist. Um, as long as you can tell everybody who's making your film what shot you need um, through your storyboards, then they've done their job really well. So next we're going to go to something called a close-up. And again, we're getting closer on this person, so a close-up could be just a face, but it could be other things too. Um, as you can imagine, a close-up is exactly kind of what it says on the tin. It's a closer-up shot. And again, when we're talking about seeing detail, seeing expression, or really focusing on one particular thing, a close-up is really going to benefit us there. Um, again, you know, because we're not being, we can see even less of the background, it might be out of focus or kind of obscured completely. Um, you know, the whole screen, if it was actually on the camera or here, your whole rectangle of storyboard is going to be full with one particular thing. If it's a face, you might be really, it, this might be a really good way to see an expression. If someone is really happy or really angry, um, you know, this close up might give you that idea. Equally, if someone was sending a text message on their phone, it may be a close up of their hands, um, you know, kind of typing in on the screen. Something we wouldn't even be able to tell what was happening if it was in a wide shot, but in a nice close up shot, it really focuses our attention on that area. Grant, so have you got a close up? Yeah, so what I've done is, We've went from this medium close-up with the, the King smile at his kingdom to him being a little bit overjoyed, a little bit overwhelmed here. So we've just got his eyes, his nose and his mouth and he's got a big smile on his face of what he's looking at there. So this is a close-up where we're just framing the face of the character and everything else, that doesn't matter for this little moment in the scene. Um, it lets the audience know how a character's feeling or they can see what emotions are on the screen as well. So let's try another close-up maybe of it, of something different so we can kind of show the variety of reasons we might use those. And again, you know, you don't have to make a film in using these orders. You don't have to have an extreme wide to a wide to a medium to a close-up, etc. You know, you can kind of mix and match. Whatever's going to be important in your scene, that's the order you can put them in. And you use a storyboard like a sort of comic book strip where you kind of space it. This thing happens, then the next, then the next, then the next. But you've got to think what one of your shots is going to be the best one to use for it. So again, I want to see someone running through a field. Well, maybe I'm using a wide shot to see their full body, but then I'm seeing some somebody hit the send button on an important email. Well, maybe we go to an extreme, uh, a close up there so we can see, you know, that finger hitting that uh, key. So as you can see here, our gangster character is moving his glasses down just to get a better look at this character we drew previously, looking all suspicious now. Um, but again, as Chris says, this doesn't have to be faces. It can be hands, it can be parts of the body, or it can be specific items. Close ups can be of objects or um, little things in the scene that might be important. Um, so if you think about things like in, in fantasy films, it might be a necklace or it could be some sort of magic jewel or a crown, something like that. We call these things props. And when you're making a film, um, even if it's a stop motion film uh, and you have to kind of create these things or find these things around the house 
or even buy them on a professional film. Um, you know, these important items can be used through the story. So again, planning for these in your storyboards is really useful um, because you don't only know what it's going to look like on the shot, but you kind of get a good idea um, of why you would want to use it too. So again, it's all really important planning because you don't want to turn up on the day and think, oh, I want my character to have a sword. Well, unless you've planned that beforehand and included that in your storyboards, the people who might be in charge of finding props and finding stuff like armor in that case, um, won't know about it. So again, you this is a really useful place for it. All those names that come up in the credits at the end of the film, you know, keep an eye out for stuff like storyboard artists and how important they, them doing their job is to actually getting those final props and items ready for the finished feature film. Okay, so the next one we're going to start looking at is the extreme close-up. We've gone from an extreme wide shot where we see a whole location, but now extreme close. Well, now we're in a really super close-up detail. Um, this might be to really emphasize one particular thing. If a character's really angry, we might see their eyes really close up. Or if someone, um, is going in for a kiss, we might see the lips really close up. Or if someone's just painted their fingernails, we might get a close up on their thumb to see some of the beautiful artwork that they've kind of created on themselves. An extreme close up means that the director of the film and the camera operator have decided together, like, we want our audience to focus on this one particular thing. There's no other thing more important to see, not the costumes, not the backgrounds, not anything more important than what we're looking at right now. In an extreme close-up, having the camera or the shot as close as possible is really going to show that off. Grant, have you got an extreme close-up you're working on? Yep, so here we have the king's eye. So we've went all the way from right out into the king's kingdom, went the, into the room, we went on the balcony, we've seen his face, he's so happy, and then we've got tears of joy right at the end there. Okay, so we've went from all of that way out, expanding, went closer and closer and closer in. But again, as Chris says, you can you can mix and match these shots. So it's, it's all about how you're gonna tell that story and having to think about what's most important in every scene and every shot as well. Um, the last one we've done, we've done an extreme close-up of this suspicious character having a gun. So someone's went back. So I've wrote, drew a little gun there, drew bang, and that's like the end of the mystery there. So we've went right in for on close on an object this time. As opposed to it being a part of the character, we've went in on a specific object that's part of the scene instead. So when you're creating your storyboards for your film planning, for your comics, for your stop motion animation, or whatever you might be creating or whatever you might want to create or have this as a job in the future, storyboards is a really important way to begin that planning. These are just some of the basic building blocks, but from them you can create a really interesting story. You don't just want to put the camera down and, ra and randomly have the actors stand in front of it. You want to be thinking, what is the best way to show off this character's expression? What they're saying, the items they're dealing with perhaps. Um, and again, shot types using storyboards is a great way to demonstrate this and great practice for you becoming a filmmaker in the future. Thanks for watching today and if you like this make sure you check out our Facebook page which is Wickham 89 Media. And hopefully we'll see you back at the Customs House really soon. We'll be behind the cameras but you can see what shot types we're using. We really want to see what film ideas you can come up with. So make sure if you draw any storyboards, you don't have to draw them in pen or pencil. You can do them on the computer too, or even take photographs as planning. Uh, we'd love to see those as comments under this post and tag in the Customs House, tag in us, Wickham 89 Media, and we hope to see you really soon. Look after yourself and thank you for watching. Thanks, bye.